I'm going to greet you like we do in the South. Hey, y'all. <laughs> and it's good to, good to be with you. A real joy for me and Elliot to be together because a lot of times we're not anymore. Um, I'm going all over the place, mainly to Waldenburg, but it's a joy for us to be with you today. And, you know, uh, let me just say, we're going to celebrate our 50th anniversary in a, in a month or two. So... Uh, she has been an unwavering support for me for a long time, and uh, don't quit now. <laughs> um, so we're we're really grateful to be here. Grateful for uh, Pastor Robbie inviting me to be here. I, I'm not sure exactly why I heard what he said, but I'm not exactly sure why he invited me to be with you this morning. But what a privilege it is. Um, I. Uh, I'm, I'm looking out and I'm seeing some, I'm, don't take this the wrong way, but seeing some old friends. Uh, and it's good to see new faces because God is bringing you together to do great things in this community. And, and I keep up with what's going on from a distance. And I, I'm very, very excited about what God's doing through this church and this community and beyond. And I'll tell you, I'm a big fan of Robbie and Allison, and I have been for a long time. And they are a, a great team together, and together uh, with you, uh, they are, uh, with your help and, and, and your involvement, your commitment, your belief in the vision of making disciples here in Monk's Corner, uh, you are becoming a church uh, that is truly impacting this community, and that's what it's all about. Uh, as I stand here this morning, I can't help but recall another time I was in this very building uh, and asked to speak. Uh, I remember the date very vividly, and you'll, you'll remember it as well, September the 11th, 2001. Uh, I was asked to, to come and, and speak to an assembly of students. Uh, Brian may remember it. Uh, he was just a little fellow at the time, and, and um, you know, I, I just heard somebody call and told me to turn on the television. I was at home studying, and of course, I watched the, the smoke coming up, the flames in the first tower, and then the plane hit the second tower, and then, you know, we're all trying to figure out what, what is happening here, and then I get another call from uh, the school here, and, and they asked me to come and, and, and speak to the students, and, and, uh, and I did, I came, uh, so unprepared, not sure exactly what to say, but I, I turned to Psalm 23, and just from a, a heart of fear and uncertainty, speaking to hearts that were fearful and uncertain about what was happening in the world, um, I, I just spoke from my heart from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I will fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And I'm just reminded that, you know, words are powerful. Words are important. Words have great impact on the lives of people, whether for good or for evil. And I recall that, um, that leaders, in particular, while we all will have to give an account of every word that we speak, which is really an awesome thing to, to consider. Leaders, in particular, have a great responsibility to speak the truth and to say things well. Not so much opinion, but reflecting the word of God. And we have a great responsibility, don't we, Robbie? 
Um, we have a great responsibility because of the platform we have been given and because of the intrinsic value, the intrinsic power of words. And this has been something that's always fascinated me, how, how leaders employ words to empower the people of God, the people they lead. And I've often wondered, how, how, how does a national leader inspire his people in times of crisis, in times of, of trial, in times of war? How does a field commander on the battlefield summon the words to inspire those he leads into battle to fight and to keep fighting when the battle seems lost. And how does a coach, for example, and you know, you gotta throw in a coach thing or a sports thing in the, in the dynamic of this. How does a coach summon the right words to say to his players to make them believe that they can win the game even when it looks like the game is already lost? It seems to me that it comes down to the right leader saying the right thing at the right time with the right heart motivation. There's a verse in scriptures, Proverbs 25, 11, and it says this, and I'm using the CEV version. It says, the right word at the right time is like gold set in silver. In other words, it's priceless, it's powerful. And there are those times and circumstances when a leader somehow summons words of power and passion and principle that penetrates hopefully sometimes bypasses the mind, but penetrates the heart of those he leads to believe in a cause that is bigger than themselves so that in the moment they rise above their own fears and anxieties and doubts to fight, if I could use that word, to fight as a people possess with a high and holy purpose no matter what the personal cost may be. And you know, these occasions, I think, are rare, but they do happen. And most are forgotten in the haze of history, but some are remembered. Like we remember, one such occasion occurred during the early days of the Second World War when England seemed ripe for the picking by Hitler's relentless desire to conquer all of Europe and beyond. And things were looking rather bleak. England had sent a very large army, the Royal Expeditionary Force, to France to try to resist German, Germany's advance through Europe. And they were run back to the coast, to Dunkirk. They were trapped. They were hemmed in. And England didn't have the capacity of, in their military and even in their navy to go and rescue these men. But somehow it was really a miraculous thing. You know, and you've maybe seen that not too... Uh, long ago, a movie came out about it. Uh, they sent fishing vessels and other private boats and small ships and a whole armada to Dunkirk, and they rescued 338,000-plus men. But Prime Minister Winston Churchill and the military leaders didn't see that as a victory, didn't see that as a good omen. That larger force had, having to retreat 
I mean, things were looking very bleak. All of England was worried about what was coming. All of England was worried that Hitler was going to invade England and that England would become a German state dictated by another evil madman. We have a few of those from time to time. And so in June the 4th, on June the 4th, 1940, Churchill stood before the House of Commons and made his historic, and you know, looking back, an historic speech to the House of Commons, known as his darkest hour speech. And in that speech, he said this, among other things, we shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. It would be another five years of bloodshed, of hardship and great sacrifice before Germany surrendered to the Allies on May the 7th, 1945. But it was Churchill's speech to the nation and to the world in part, tried to persuade the Americans to get in the war and to come to their aid and it'd be another over a year before America actually entered the war. And so this speech reverberated throughout those five years until victory was won. I think of an Italian general, General Giuseppe Garibaldi, who led an army and the unification of Italy. And it looked very bleak during one point in the war, and he spoke to his men, he spoke to his troops, and he said to them, I offer neither pay, nor quarters, nor food. I offer only hunger, thirst, forced marches, battles, and death. Let him who loves his country with his heart and not merely his lips, follow me. And they follow to victory. And then again, of course, the sports illustration. You always have to throw one of those in. I think of the legendary coach of Notre Dame, Newt Rockney, whose 1928 team wasn't doing so well. And they were playing Army. And they were down at halftime to Army. And so the boys file into the locker room at halftime, and they, they are dejected. They're disappointed because they were letting down their beloved coach, and, and they were waiting to get an earful, and Rockney comes in, and he doesn't berate them. He doesn't scold them. He doesn't tell them everything they're doing wrong. Instead, he pulls up a chair, and he sits down, in front of his boys, and he tells them a story, the story of George Gipp, who at that time was a legendary player for Notre Dame. And this took place, this story took place eight years before this halftime story. But he tells his boys about going to see the Gipper, as he was known. He's in the hospital, and he's dying and he says to Rockney, he says, Coach, he said, there's going to come a time in a game when your boys need to be lifted up, when they need some real inspiration. And so he says, when you come to that time, remember to tell them, go out there and win one for the Gipper. And that's exactly what they did. And Notre Dame beat Army that day. 
because of the inspiration that came from the story of the Gipper. They made a movie out of it. Ronald Reagan, anybody? You know, uh, one of his best roles as a movie star. I have to tell you, every preacher that I know of secretly longs to deliver a line like that or a speech like that. To be able to find the right words at the right moment to rally his people to fight the good fight as soldiers of the cross, to spur them on with all of their hearts, no matter what the personal cost, for the cause of Christ, and to spur them on toward a victorious life in Christ. And you know, I have to say, I think most Christians believe that there's nothing more in inspirational than the gospel. I mean, is there anything more inspiring than the good news of Jesus Christ? And has there ever been anything written that is more powerful and more life-changing than the Bible, the Holy Word of God? And yet the grim reality that exists right now, in the churches in America, would defy that assumption. Where is the church so inspired by the gospel and empowered by the Spirit that the Great Commission is being lived out in every member, every day, everywhere they go, sharing Christ, modeling Christ, speaking words of the gospel, and making disciples of Jesus Christ. Where is the church so devoted to the teaching and preaching of the word of God that members are joyfully growing in grace and in the knowledge of God that they're bearing fruit to the glory of God? Where is is a church whose members so hunger for the Word of God, but also faithfully commit themselves to practicing what it says. Just last week, Lifeway Research published an article that I happened to read, and the title of the article, and it was about a, a research project that had been completed, and the research project's name was 2022 Pastors Needs uh, Project or something like that. And in this article, they uh, are publishing the results of that research, and they are outlining the issues that pastors are dealing with today. Nothing in it really surprised me. And their findings aren't new, but what they did find was this, that the number one issue that pastors are struggling with today, and I just quote this part of the article, three in four, three in four U.S. Protestant pastors, 75% say apathy and a lack of commitment is a people dynamic that they find challenging in their churches. Well, that's 2022. I can tell you, it was true in 1978 when I began pastoring a church. And it's still true today. As a part of my work with pastors, I'm presently leading a Two groups of small groups of pastors, one in Manning, one in Sumter, meet with them monthly. And I can tell you that in our discussions every month, they affirm the findings of this project. They use words like apathy, lack of involvement, lack of commitment. They want to know. These pastors are asking me. They want to know, what does it take to get a church to move? What does it take to get a church 
to be on fire for God? What does it take to get people to be involved, to be committed to the cause of Christ, to take the gospel seriously and to take to heart the word of God? And I have to tell you, there are no easy answers to that question. I wish there were. But what does come to mind is what James teaches us about the biblical imperative of an active faith. The biblical imperative of an active faith. You know, James is largely remembered, if not for anything else, he's largely remembered for arguing that faith without works is dead. In the message version of that passage in James 2, he argues that when we separate faith, what we say we believe, from our works, how we live our lives, we end up with corpse. Listen to this part of the argument. He's, he's using illustrations out of the Old Testament to make his point, and he uses Abraham as an illustration, and he uses Rahab. And in this part, he says, the same with Rahab, the Jericho harlot. Wasn't her action in hiding God's spies and helping them escape the seamless unity, listen to this, the seamless unity of believing and doing what counted with God. The very moment you separate body and spirit, you end up with a corpse. Separate faith and works, and you get the same thing, a corpse. Listen, when, when people in churches appear dead or lifeless, when people in churches look like a corpse, it's probably because there is a disconnect between what they say they believe and how they live their lives. And this may at least in part explain why we're in the mess we're in in the American church. We believe what the Bible says, don't we? Up to a point. We believe up to the point where it requires us, where it compels us, and I might say where even where it commands us to change something about the way we live. We believe up to the point where the Bible confronts us with the reality of where we are spiritually. We believe up to the point where the Bible challenges our lifestyle, our habits, our values, and our priorities. So when we separate our faith from our works, which is basically obedience to Christ, we have stopped taking the gospel to heart. And here's what I mean. Taking something to heart is to take an intellectual belief, a knowledge of the truth, what the Bible says, right? And making it a matter of the heart. When you make something a matter of the heart, that's where your will is. When you take something to heart, it's a matter of the will to trust and obey the truth. It's the difference between a passive belief and an active faith. And this is what James is talking about. When you take something which God says in his word to heart, it changes more than the way you think about something. It changes the way we respond to all that Jesus has called us to be and to do. It changes us 
from being casual about our Christianity, being carnal in our living, or being a closet Christian, not, you know, you know how we say, well, what I believe is just private. None of your business. Changes us from that kind of mindset and that kind of lifestyle to being fully devoted followers of Christ and fully committed, committed members of his body, which is the church. When we take the gospel to heart, it changes us from being anxious, worried, and fearful about life, fearing tomorrow, fearing what may come, fearing the future, fearing what's after life, and living a life of complete peace and joy and hope. So for an example, what Jesus said to his disciples in John 16, 33, to those fearful, grief-stricken disciples, you know that passage in John 14, 15, and 16, that whole section there, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his death. And that's all they hear. But he talks about other things. He talks about his resurrection. But they're grief-stricken. And at the end, here in, in, in the 16th chapter, verse 33, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you will have peace. In this world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart. Have courage. Be encouraged. Have hope. I have overcome the world. You know, those men heard Jesus say that, didn't they? I mean, out of his own lips. We're privileged to read the scriptures. They heard it from the master himself. He spoke it. They heard it. But did they take it to heart? And the answer is no, they did not take it to heart. Not yet. Not then. I mean, you look at the rest of the story. If they had taken it to heart, would they have all deserted him in the critical moment? If Peter, one of them, if Peter, for example, had taken what Jesus said to heart, would he have denied the Lord not once, not twice, but three times on the night of his arrest? If they had taken it to heart, what Jesus said just in this verse, Would they have hidden themselves away and, and locked the door? Would they have been filled with that kind of fear? No. Instead, at the critical moment, when the shadow of the cross overshadowed them, they fled like metal arcs at the shadow of a red tail hawk. So my question is, how do, how do you and I take to heart the words of the Lord just in this verse when he says, in this world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. And what I'm asking is this, how do we live out the gospel every day? How do we live out the gospel consistently, courageously, and confidently how do we live out the gospel in our personal lives, in our communal lives, as the world conquerors that we are in Christ? How do we live that overcoming life that Jesus and the gospels and the rest of the New Testament tell us that we are? And to answer that question, I would urge you to do this. You have to do this. You have to take to heart the whole will of God. The whole will of God is a phrase that Paul uses. 
in Ephesians chapter 20, um, where he's met with the elders of the church of Ephesus. Paul's on his way back to Jerusalem. Everybody's telling him, don't go to Jerusalem, they're going to kill you. But he's, but he's led by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. He doesn't know exactly why, but the Lord has told him to go to Jerusalem, and everybody else says, don't go. Even a prophet said, came and said, don't go to Jerusalem. It's going to be bad for you. So he's speaking to the church, the elders of the church at Ephesus, on his way to Jerusalem. And they're sad. They don't want him to go either. But he has something he wants to say to them. And this is what he says, in part. Now, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. Wow. But this is what he says. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. And basically what he's saying to these guys is, look, if some of your people, if some of you, don't endure to the end, if some of you fail to live out the gospel, if, if some of you just don't believe, don't hold me responsible because I have not hesitated to reveal to you what has been revealed to me. I have not failed in my responsibility as a herald of the gospel to preach and to teach everything that the Lord gave me to give to you. And what I've given you is the whole will of God. The King James Version says the whole counsel of God. The NLV says all the truth about God. The New English Translation says the whole purpose of God. To put it another way, he's saying the whole will of God is the entire unabridged story of God and his ultimate plan and purpose for man and how it all comes out in the end. You see, the gospel doesn't end with the cross and the resurrection. Don't misunderstand me. The cross and the resurrection is the centerpiece of the gospel, is it not? But it's not the end of the story. It's not the whole gospel. The story doesn't end there. There's more to it. There's more God. There's more gospel. There's more good. There's more grace. There's more glory to come. So what about the rest of the story then? And how does it affect your life? Isn't that what we always want to know? How does this affect my life? How does the rest of the story affect your life? Where you live today and how you live your life today and how you hope to live it in the future. What about the ascension? Okay, let's go from the resurrection to the ascension. 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus spent that time with his disciples teaching them more about the kingdom of God. And then one day, he ascended. Well, where did he go? The Bible says he went to be with the Father, to sit at the right hand of the Father as Lord, Savior, cross and resurrection, Lord. He's ruling from heaven, sitting in a position of power and authority and glory next to the Father, also as our great high priest making intercession for me and for you and for all Christians. How does that affect your life? What about the day of Pentecost that happened 50 days after the resurrection, 10 days after the ascension, when Jesus fulfilled his promise to the church, to the believers that I'm going away, and when I go away, when I get back to the Father, I'm going to ask him to send the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of power, upon you, the church. So that every believer, whoever believes, 
receives that same gift at his conversion, the gift of the indwelling and the empowering, the enabling of the Holy Spirit. How does that affect your life every day? What about the newly empowered church launching the missionary movement not long after the day of Pentecost? The persecution broke out. You know, it's amazing how much trouble, persecution, hardship, how as a part of the whole will of God, it spurs us to growth and to do the things that God has called us to do. It's because the persecution broke out. The church spread out of Jerusalem into Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And it's still happening today. How does that affect your life today? And what about these end times in which we live? You know, we are living in the end time. This is the church age. And at the end of the age, there's more. But, but what about these end times in which Jesus said, you're going to have trouble. And the apostles said, you're going to face persecution. You're going to have tribulation. What about going back to Jesus' word? I have overcome. Be encouraged. And so what about the imminent second coming of Christ? Coming, as the scripture says, with a loud command, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. What about his coming again? What about the promised resurrection that is coming when the dead in Christ, when the thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of graves will be opened and glorious bodies will be raised from those graves to meet the Lord in the air and to be with the Lord forever. What about the resurrection that is coming? What about the very end? What about the final battle when Jesus, the conquering Christ, comes and casts Satan and his demons and all the wicked and unbelieving into the lake of fire. And think about this. I don't think Christians often think about this. What about the fiery destruction of the cosmos. Peter says where the elements are going to melt. And the Bible says that God is going to make everything new. What about the new earth and the new heaven? What about the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband? What about the marriage supper of the Lamb? at the end of time, when we will be with the Lord forever, where there'll be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more dying, no more pain, for the former things has passed away. How does that affect your life today? You see, if we fail to grasp and hold on to and take to heart the whole will of God, we'll end up constantly discouraged, constantly in despair, full of anxiety and worry about how we're going to live in this evil world when Jesus said, fear not, I have overcome the world. And listen, maybe today is a day that you just need to take that next step, move that intellectual belief into a active faith that affects your witness in this community for Christ and the life and health of this church family. Will you take that next step? Will you make that commitment to move your belief into an act of faith? Maybe today you're here, you don't even understand anything I've said. That's possible but it's also possible that you feel the power of God at work in your life. You don't understand it, but that's the power of God. It's the call of God through the Holy Spirit to put your faith in Jesus and believe the good news. If God is moving you in any way this morning, I encourage you to talk to somebody, to talk to pastor, 
rob me, uh, speak to somebody at, at the desk as you leave today, but do something with what God has put on your heart to do. Amen.